Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we want to thank you so much for the privilege of this moment, being here in this hour. I ask God that as you speak now to your people, that you will use me as a microphone, which with you will have this conversation with your people. I pray, God, that it will be clear that lives will be transformed and changed, and that we will leave this place saying it was good for us to be here. Thank you, Father, for your great love for us. We thank you, Father, for the gift of mothers. We thank you, Father, for uh, the rich history and the heritage here, Father, at this church, and I pray, God, that you will continue to bless the mothers here. And as we go through uh, this time, Father, we'll be focused on your word. We ask, Lord, that we will be enriched, we will be blessed, we'll be drawn even closer to you. We thank you for your love for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning and happy Sabbath. I'll say it now before it's... I uh, um, just want to say quickly thank you to uh, Brother Robinson and uh, Brother Augustine for the invitation to be here with you. I consider it a privilege uh, to stand before you to present the Word of God. And uh, even as I stand here, I am really thankful for those who have uh, supported me and for those who I've gotten to meet and gotten to know since I've been here since January. I really enjoyed the four months that I've been here uh, at, in Columbia and at just this church. And uh, I pray that God will continue to bless this church, even as you look forward to, uh, to leadership for the church. And even as you pray for the different individuals here who have prayer requests, I've definitely been keeping those in my prayers as well. Um, so without, without further ado, let's, let's enter, enter into the word of God. You would, you would agree with me that we live in an age where technology is advancing. In our day, we've seen developments in nearly every area of science, technology, research, engineering, mechanics, medicine, and travel, to name a few. The entertainment and television are arena continues to expand our, our view of any and everything to the next level, from high definition to, to Blu-rays to 3D. You'd agree with me also that we live in a fast-paced world. We call it the, the microwave age. It seems as if we need everything faster, and the faster we get things done, or the faster we get things, the better our lives would be. The microwave age has infiltrated almost every aspect of our lives, and even the churches. And even, uh, sadly, many marriages have been infected by this microwave age. The, it seems as if the goal is now to get in and get out as quickly as you can, this microwave age. There's a fascinating quote that presents a counter to this reality. It says this, when you live in a rapidly moving swirl, you can only view your surroundings with a glance. Poetry requires us to slow down and take time to pause. This was written by Naomi Shihab Nye, the chancellor for the Academy of American Poets. Poets are individuals who put pen to paper, and as this chancellor puts it, they, they grab our attention to a particular theme which engenders a certain emotion, and for that moment, in that time, in that place, time seems to stand still, and our minds are captured with the world the poet has created for us. When a, when a good poet, a good poet, puts pen to paper, the results are impressive. Today I want to introduce to you the poet of poets, the one who does not need to put pen to paper to accomplish his purposes. He doesn't need to vent through the literary devices of poetry about the injustices we see in the world or the issues of his life. You see, this poet of all poets created life. This poet does not need to put pen to paper, but all this poet needs to do is to pronounce a proclamation to the problem and everything changes. This poet of poets, this poet of poets, I, I, I believe, is a poet because a poet is defined as a person possessing special powers of imagination or expression. And I don't know about you, but it takes divine imagination to make something out of nothing. This, this poet of poets 
this celestial being, our God, he used the fabric of nothingness as his canvas or as his writing pad, and he created ex nihilo or out of nothing. This poet became the first poet because he spoke and it stood fast. All he had to do was, was mention it and it appeared because he can create something out of nothing. And I don't know about you, but I want to pause right here to say I'm thankful that we serve a God who desires to make something beautiful out of nothing, something beautiful even out of our lives. This first poet, our great God, didn't stop at creation, but when the need arose for man to be rescued from the deadly grip of sin, this poet pronounced a proclamation to the problem of the fall and promised us in Genesis 3 verse 15 that a deliverer would come. It reminds me of the song that says, my deliverer is coming. My deliverer is standing by. And throughout history, the, the thousands of years of history of the, the, the lifetime of this world, this poet has constantly tried to communicate that message of redemption and salvation in very creative ways through nations, individuals, men and women alike, so that we would not forget his promise of a redeemer. It is this creative process of communicating to man his great love for man that I have termed the poetry of salvation. The title of our message today, the poetry of salvation. And how could it not be poetry? For our great God, our creator God, who made this intricately beautiful earth that you see around you, just for us to inhabit it, he would do nothing less than a creative work when it comes to your salvation the one whom he loves so dearly. It has to be the poetry of salvation. Now granted, it would take a series of seminars to carefully look at all the stylistic genres of how God has communicated through the authors of the Bible this creative way of expressing his love for man. But for the purposes of our discourse today, we will just wet our taste buds on the reflection of one Bible writer, one apostle, one very famous apostle, his name is Paul, and the book is Romans. Turn with me to the book of Romans as we briefly look at what Paul was trying to communicate through this book to the church in Rome. Paul's letter to the Jews and Gentiles living in Rome was, was not an attempt to answer specific questions or concerns of the church, but it was a proclamation or a reminder of what his understanding of the gospel was. Romans, it is said, is the longest, most theologically significant book that Paul has written, or letter that Paul has written. It is called the very purest of all the things he has written by the great theologian Luther. And within the book of Romans, Paul uses various literary devices to communicate his message of God's great love to his people. And many people have tried to place Paul's letters in a, a box or a, a very close literary form, but somehow Paul's letter seems to not quite fit that literary form of the day. It seems as if Paul has just borrowed various literary conventions of his day to carry across his message, to move along his argument. And many individuals have said that Paul's letter carries with it different themes, but the greatest theme of Paul's message to the, to the Romans is this. God has intervened in the history of man to reclaim his creation for himself and to bring salvation to his people. The book of Romans is simply the gospel of Jesus told to the people in Rome by the Apostle Paul. He tries to communicate to them what the gospel means to him and what the gospel can mean to them. Friends, I'd encourage you to spend a thoughtful hour listening to the book of Romans or reading the book of Romans, I promise you, you will not be disappointed. Paul, as he writes to the people in Rome, reflects upon his situation, reflects upon his life as a student of the word of God. He reflects upon his life before Christ. He reflects upon his life after he has met Christ, and he's amazed at the love and patience of Christ working in his life. I believe as we slow down as individuals in this day and age and take the time to pause and reflect on our own situation, we will also realize and be amazed by the love and patience of God 
tactfully working in our lives. I'm thankful for Sister Kennelly's testimony that shows us that God is patient with us and will not stop until we yield to him. It has to be the poetry of salvation for a God who knows that sometimes we don't really want to talk to him, that still fervently wants to communicate his love to us. The poetry of salvation. Paul writes about the gospel as the righteousness of God by faith. He talks about the gospel as the power of God for salvation. As a matter of fact, in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Romans 1, verse 16, he declares, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, first to the Jew and also to the Greek. Paul writes about the gospel as it relates to the people of Israel. And as Paul transitions from the reality that God is able to save even the Jews whose leaders rejected him, as he transitions to the reality that we can be transformed as we follow and believe in Jesus, it's as if he becomes overwhelmed by the grandeur of it all, and he makes a declaration that he could no longer keep in, it seems. This declaration can be found in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, which is our theme text. Romans 11, verse 33. And as you turn there, you will notice how calmly Paul is speaking in the verses of Romans 11 before he gets to this point. He's calmly going through his argument. He's calmly sharing with the, the people of Rome in this letter uh, what he thinks about how God is working with the people of Israel. But then he comes to this point, and there's an outburst of joy and amazement in verse 33 of Romans 11. Paul says this, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, Paul is in awe of the poetry of salvation. He's in awe of how God could work to save mankind. He continues, he says, How unsearchable are his judgments, and his ways are past finding out. If Paul knew the song, he probably would, probably would say, How deep the Father's love for us. Paul is here amazed about the salvation that God is willing to bring to his people. As we look at that verse, I believe that there are three significant themes that we can embrace from Paul's reflection of God's salvation that he offers to you and I. Firstly, salvation is rich. It is the wealth, the fullness, and the abundance of grace possessed by God and exercised towards men. If you look at Proverbs 22, verse 4, Proverbs 22, verse 4, puts it this way. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Proverbs 22, 4. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. So there are blessings associated with cooperating with God in this life. But a few verses, a few chapters over in Proverbs 20, 27, Verse 24, Proverbs 27, verse 24, it clarifies the statement by saying this, For riches are not forever, and doth the crown endure to every generation? The message here between these two texts is that sal the salvation of God brings with it the riches of God that are far greater than the physical eye can see. But the riches that we gain by, by selfish ambition in this world, they are merely physical. Because the riches that God gives are eternal, are enduring, but the riches of man are temporary. Paul is here trying to communicate, even in Romans 11 verse 33, that salvation is rich. Ephesians 2 verse 7 says this, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness towards us through Christ Jesus. The reflection here is that there are exceeding riches associated with a relationship with Jesus. Paul continues, he, he terms this reality in Ephesians 3 verse 8, the unsearchable riches of Christ. There's no wonder then that in Revelation, the angels are around the throne of God 
and the beasts and the elders and the 144,000, John sees them in vision saying this in Revelation 5 verse 12, worthy, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. Friends, salvation is rich. It is the poetry of salvation. But oh, there's more. Paul would also like to communicate to us, secondly, that not only is salvation rich, but salvation is deep. The depths of salvation. The word depth is used in reference to the deep things of God and the physical comparison that the writers of the Bible often associate with depth is the depth of the sea. In Psalm 130 verses 1 and 2, Psalm 130 verses 1 and 2, we hear the psalmist saying this, Out of the depths I cried unto thee, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let thine ears be attentive to the voice of my supplications. The, the psalmist here is in the depths of despair, looking up to God, and he's crying, Oh God, if you can only hear the voice of my supplications, hear my cry, and attend to my need. He's in the depths of his despair. How are we to understand depth? The deepest lake in the world currently is Lake, ba lake Baikal. It's in Siberia, southern Russia. It is a natural lake, and it is 5,712 feet deep. That is over a mile straight down, deepest lake. But the deepest oceans, the deepest ocean of the world's ocean is found in the Mariana Trench. It is located in the Western Pacific Ocean. So that's east of Japan and north of Papua New Guinea. And it reaches a maximum known depth of 36,070 feet. That's over six and a half miles straight down. So when you think about depth and where the psalmist is crying out from, this is where he is, in the depth of his despair. Friends, even though he's in the depth of despair and he's all the way down looking up for help, the beauty of salvation is no matter where you are, in the depths of despair, the depths of guilt, the depths of doubt, no matter where you are, the depths of fear, the depths of addiction, or the depths of uncertainty, I just want to stop by here this morning to remind you that the salvation God offers goes deeper. His salvation is able to go underneath all that stuff, underneath all that despair, and pick you up to the place where he desires for you to be, a place of peace, a place of joy, a place of rest. It is the poetry of salvation. Salvation is deep. In the very same chapter, verse 7 of Psalm 130, it seems the psalmist gets this picture of God being able to go underneath all that, underneath that depth and go deeper. And he says in verse 7 of Psalm 130, let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenty of salvation. Salvation is deep. Psalm 139, a very popular psalm, verse 7, has with it a question. It says, Psalm 139, verse 7, Whither shall I go from thy spirit? Or whither shall I flee from thy presence? If I ascend up into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning, and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. It is no wonder then that in answering his own question, asked in Romans 8 verse 35, the question was, who shall separate us from the love of God? Paul answers this question in verse 39. He says, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Salvation is deep. It is the poetry of salvation. 
Not only is salvation rich, not only is salvation deep, but finally, salvation is available today. The story is told of a mother who lived with her son a long, long time ago. Her son was accused of a crime that he really did not commit. The day came for the son to be tried, and the son was, was tried, and it was found that he was guilty. They found him guilty, and the mother went, and she pleaded with the judge, please, sir, my, my son is innocent. Please let him go. But no one would listen to this mother. And so in those days, the law was, if he was found guilty, they would build a stage. They would set and tie the noose. They would add a trap door on the stage. And in order for the sentence to be carried out, the bell had to toll in the church. So the day came. They brought him up to the stage. The people gathered because for them it was a sport. The people gathered and they watched and waited for the bell to toll in the church. Everyone excitedly turned to the church to hear the bell toll so they could see this young man's life end. They looked and they waited. And there was silence. They sent a boy, please go to the church, find out what's going on. The boy ran to the church and he saw the bell boy tugging on the bell, but the bell would not sound. And the people are now disappointed because now they have to let this young man go. He would not die because the law of the land stated that if the bell did not toll, he would not die. And so excitedly, this young boy runs home to his mother to share with her the good news that he is alive because the bell didn't toll. He runs inside the house, he pushes the door open, and he starts screaming, Mother, Mother, where are you? He doesn't hear a response, and so he's a bit concerned. He runs around the corner. Mother, where are you? He looks over the window, and he sees his mother in her rocking chair. He runs around to, to, to face her, and, and she's battered and bruised. And he, he is now upset. He's now willing to go back to the gallows because he wants to know, who did this to you, mother? How could this happen to you? And she told him the story. She said, son... I went to the courthouse and I pleaded for you and nobody would listen to me. Nobody would believe that you were innocent, son. So on the day that you were to be executed, I went to the church. I climbed the stairs to the bell. I, I stretched over on the gong of the bell. I wrapped myself around the gong of the bell so that every time the bellboy pulled on that bell and every time the bellboy tried to make the bell sound, son, I was taking the hit for you. Friends, the poetry of salvation says that the God who loves us and the God who offers us this rich salvation, this deep salvation, the one that is available to us today. He says, I sent my son because of my great love for you, and he took the hit for you. Amen. He died on the cross so that you could live for eternity. And that salvation is available today. Amen. My appeal is simply this. If your desire is to renew that commitment with Jesus, to walk again with Jesus, in that salvation which is so rich, which is so deep, which is offered to you today because it will never lose its power. And we serve a God who's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. If your desire is to renew that commitment to walk with him again, to walk with him for the first time, or just to say, God, I'd rather have you, I invite you to stand with me. And if you so desire, you can meet me at the altar. Our God is a God who will not give up on us. I pray that in our lives, we will not give up on him. But we will declare with our lives, I'd rather have Jesus than anything 
this world affords today. Amen. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Pray with me. Father in heaven, we, we like Paul, are amazed that you would do all of this just for us. That you would communicate in such creative ways and such vivid ways that no matter how far we go from you, no matter how, how much we feel as if we, we don't deserve to be a part of your family, God, you, your salvation is rich. We are bought with a price, God. Father, no matter how deep in despair we are, God, your salvation is deep. It can go deeper than wherever we are. And Father, we are thankful that your salvation is available today. God, by faith, we claim the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. Father, we believe that you died for our sins. And Lord, even in this moment, Father, even in the stillness of this hour, Father, we, we give to you our all. We lay everything at your feet. Because God, we'd rather have you than anything this world affords today. Father, we look forward to your soon return. And God, we ask that we will continue to live lives that will represent to the world that you can do anything but fail. And if you can do it for us, you can do it for them. Thank you, Father, for your love today. We pray these things in the sweet, holy name of Jesus. Let the church say, Amen.